Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you'll learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to Big Mike Fund Podcast. Uh, I'm the Big Mike. Uh, my name is Mike Zlatnik. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Today, uh, I have a distinct privilege of having Clay Malcolm as uh, my guest. Clay, welcome. Glad to be here, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So I've known Clay for years. He is a uh, director of business development at New Direction IRA. Clay, did I get your title correctly? Absolutely. And um, I personally have used New Direction IRA for a long time. Uh, love them. They are one of the best IRA custodians. And I had nothing but phenomenal experience working with them. And um, having Clay on the podcast uh, is uh, going to be very interesting. So, Clay, I appreciate you coming uh, on. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. It's always fun to talk to you, Mike. You've always got something interesting to, to uh, you know, talk about. Yeah, I, I, I hope to make it interesting. <laughs> this podcast business is new to me, too, so I'm, I'm just enjoying it, enjoying the journey. Uh, but um, uh, let's talk a little bit about self-directed IRA investing. It is a phenomenal idea. I personally found it to be the best thing after sliced bread. And a uh, number of years ago, I um, took my uh, traditional 401k that I uh, built over years in corporate America. I spent 15 years in the software development and uh, took that wonderful um, money and transferred over to New Direction IRA into self-directed IRA account. And uh, I found that experience to be not necessarily the most easiest one, not because of New Direction IRA, but because of the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. They took a little while to transfer the money. They uh, don't part with the money easily. But once the money got to New Direction IRA, everything became uh, fairly easy from there. So, but let's start with basics. Clay, could you talk a little bit about what is self-directed IRA investing? What is it that you guys do? And what are the benefits? Certainly. And, and you're a great test case because that's kind of the most common scenario. But a self-directed IRA really, in the case of a company like ours, allows that IRA money to keep its tax advantages, whether it's traditional or Roth or HSA for that matter, and to invest in all kinds of alternative assets, meaning that once you've made a contribution, that money takes on the new tax benefits and it's going to buy some stuff that hopes, hopefully makes it some money. And most of us are familiar with publicly traded securities, but that's not the only thing that the IRS allows. You can actually buy real estate, precious metals, you can make loans, uh, you can buy existing notes as well. Uh, you can invest in private equity. So you have a lot of options in terms of the way that you invest that money. And of course, it can compound faster because it's tax deferred. And the thing I think is most exciting about it is you get to use your own expertise or your financial team's expertise. So if you or your family member or your financial team has something that they know how to make money at, you can often use that process in your IRA to make money for your own retirement and with the tax benefits. So the idea that you get to use your own decision making and your own expertise has always been really exciting to me. And the, the scenario that you talked about is, is, like I said, it's very common. So somebody has an old 401k or an IRA and it's not performing the way they want to or they want to invest in something else. So they'll open an account at a self-directed IRA provider like us, do a transfer or a rollover. And that's not taxed and not penalized. That's a, a totally approved of move, according to the IRS. It does take a little time, a couple of weeks usually. Once that money is here with us, then you start finding the investment. The account holder does. So in terms of taking control of your financial future, this is one of the, the tools that is most on point with that type of strategy. So it's really fun for me to get to work with people who are investing their funds in, in their expertise and succeeding at it. Thank you, Clay. That was great. That was that, that was the uh, uh, really good explanation. Uh, most of us love to take control. Uh, being in control of our life uh, makes us alive. <laughs> and um, uh, controlling your own retirement money investing is uh, something powerful. 
And uh, it's not for everybody, but uh, I can tell you this, that uh, a lot of people uh, don't realize that uh, their old 401k, when it's invested, uh, you, they're paying a lot of money to uh, traditional mutual fund companies. And the value of those companies, that is fairly small. So I mean this with all due respect. Uh, I am a fund guy. I do believe in the funds. Uh, and the funds can add a lot of value. And the active fund management can be very uh, advantageous to the investors. At the same time, uh, having control and choosing your own investments is often better than leaving it to the Wall Street. So from that perspective, um, I, I'm a big proponent of the self-directed IRA investing. And you said something interesting, transfer versus rollover. Uh, one quick comment on this. I, I personally prefer the transfer because I don't want to touch the money. If you don't, if you touch the money, rollover meaning that you take the money out of your old 401k. And if you miss 60 day windows, <laughs> I press can send you a tax bill. That's why it's better to have your direction IRA initiate the transfer request to get the money, go directly to them from the old um, 401k company. So that's one quick comment on that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the type of investments. So um, having been in hard money for many years, uh, we made loans, basically investment promissory notes. And uh, the income received from the, these investments is simple interest. And um, as far as I know, it's 100% perfect for self-directed IRA. Uh, making loans or investing in notes is one of the classic ways to uh, self-direct your money. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I do think it's a very nice match between the tax benefits and the way the account works, as well as the um, ability to generate money in a, in a way that you wouldn't have otherwise. So the, you know, we're, I know that we were, we were talking about UBIT earlier as well. So one of the things about loans in the Internal Revenue Code is that there are certain exceptions to UBIT. So uh, certain investments would have some unrelated business income tax, but, but loans typically don't. They are a, a written exemption in the code. So the nice thing about it is once the account holder chooses the, the borrower, does their due diligence on them and, and sets up the note, it's often very uh, passive, doesn't take a lot of activity and you can get great returns. So, you know, finding out where that money can best be deployed is, is really the, the key to it. But the setup of it from an IRA perspective is very easy. The, we, we get the original note, we get permission from the account holder to send their IRA money out to the, to the borrower. And then shoot, the borrower can actually even pay the IRA online, make the payments online. So you can just follow it on your online portal. But like I say, it's a, that is a very straight down the middle kind of solid uh, strategy in terms of an, an asset choice from an IRA perspective. Yeah, that sounds great. I actually did the paperwork today for one small loan from, a, uh, from my IRA and I, I filled out a bi-direction letter, um, account holder acknowledgement letter, if I remember correctly, naming convention, and then the borrower filled out borrower acknowledgement letter and I signed a read and approved promissory note and this, this particular um, loan was actually unsecured. I'm, I'm making a loan to a business and I didn't have to do a, a mortgage or deed of trust. But most of the times it would be also a mortgage or deed of trust. I would have to also sign it as read and approve and a title company would close it. So as, as, uh, as a many times investor in, through self-directed IRA, the process I can tell you is fairly easy. Once you get used to it, it's, it's a walk in the park. And, and uh, the direction IRA team uh, has been phenomenal getting these requests in and responding quickly. So uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, put a put in a good word, not because I'm getting paid anything. Disclaimer, I get paid zero. I actually paid New Direction IRA for every transaction. I just like these guys and I like uh, uh, how the team works. So I am saying it's been easy and uh, they do phenomenal work. Uh, hey, Mike, if I may, about just about the investment document, because you brought up a nice point about how it is that we work and what our role is. So we don't give any tax legal or investment advice. And our role is really to document what the IRA is doing so that it gets to keep the tax advantages. So in almost any asset, there's two things that we need from the account holder, which you were just talking about. So one is written permission to disperse funds from the IRA to complete the deal, or in this case, make a loan. And then the other is just the documentation of the asset whether that's a note document or a private equity operating agreement or title to a house or whatever it is, 
So those are the two pieces that we do uh, that we need to hold that asset in trust for the account holder so that they get to keep the tax benefit. So once you kind of conceptualize the, the pieces that you're putting together, it really is pretty logical. Yeah, that sounds great. Clay. So you guys exactly, you conduct a function of a, of a custodian. You're not making any tax or financial advice. You're not doing any of that. And um, right. Uh, yeah, from, so that makes perfect sense. So what else I wanted to, um, on, on this subject, the other um, interesting um, benefit is that there's all kinds of flexibility to do secured and unsecured notes. So this particular one is an unsecured note. I've done a lot of secured notes. Uh, uh, they're basically promissory notes uh, secured by a real property. Uh, and it's also known as a private loan, hard money loan, and we do a ton of those. And um, uh, the beauty about this is, is as you mentioned, uh, interest received on, on a loan is an exception to unrelated business income tax. And for those of you who don't know, unrelated business income tax, uh, you bid is an estate tax that IRA imposes um, on uh, nonprofits or IRAs for, um, uh, for a few things. And we're gonna talk about one interesting case on this podcast when um, you can make an investment from a self-directed IRA uh, effectively in a house, um, buy a house in simple terms. And if you just buy it and you not follow this uh, interesting concept that uh, I'll talk about, you can still get good benefits of long-term ownership of the uh, real estate property, but you may become a subject to the UBIT tax, and UBIT tax rates are pretty high. So uh, whenever you can avoid UBIT, you probably should consider that. But it doesn't by any means diminish the power of self-directed IRA investing. It's just a, something that you need to be aware of. So I have an interesting case that I wanted to talk about, and um, actually in our uh, newsletter, uh, that's coming out early January. Uh, if you go to templefunding.com, uh, click newsletters, uh, there will be a newsletter in um, early January that'll talk about a very interesting idea that uh, can help a uh, self-directed area investor uh, own a real estate property or invest. Let me, let me make a politically correct statement. Invest in a uh, real estate property, have full control over the property, get the benefits from the property, and avoid UBIT. So uh, the, here's a traditional model. The traditional model, when uh, you make a self-directed IRA investment uh, buying a uh, property, you have a couple of options. One option is if you have enough uh, money in the account, you could just buy the property outright with cash. So let's just say you're buying an investment house for $100,000. You could uh, submit the paperwork to your direction IRA or another IRA custodian to uh, wire $100,000 plus the closing cost to the title company, and the title company will close, and your IRA will own the property outright. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's a great way to get cash flow, get uh, income into the IRA. Uh, and if you have no leverage on the purchase, uh, what is leverage? Leverage is a mortgage. So if you buy the proper property cash, you have no leverage, you have no UBIT. However, uh, if you went to a bank and got a mortgage and the mortgage was just say for the sake of the argument was uh, $60,000, you put down $40,000. Why do I use these numbers? Traditional mortgages are typically 70, 75%, sometimes 80% are, are what people used to when they buy a real property. But in this case, it's a little different. When IRA buys a property and gets a mortgage, you personally cannot guarantee the mortgage. It is a forbidden transaction and clay step in uh confirm if uh, if yes. you personally cannot can or cannot guarantee a mortgage that your ira uh takes right the account holder and any other disqualified persons which is basically your lineal ascendants and descendants in your family they can't pledge their personal assets in service of the loan that your ira is taking out because your ira is actually a, a different legal and financial entity than you. It's going to be the owner. So your personal property or the disqualified person's personal property can't interact in the with the IRA in that way. So that's why the loan terms that, that you're describing occur. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. So uh, effectively, your IRA has to take a non-recourse loan. The, the loan is secured by the property itself, but not secured by your personal guarantee. So from that perspective, 
uh, most banks will not give you the same amount of money as if it had personal guarantee from you because your financial strengths cannot help your IRA. So what happens is most banks will give 50%, maybe 60% loan to value mortgage or loan to purchase price. Uh, and uh, it still helps you, but two things happen. One is they give you less money. And the second thing that happens is the rate is generally a little bit higher because there is no personal guarantee on those type of loans. So you, you would still enjoy the cash flow and you would still, uh, not you, but your IRA, just to be uh, exact. Your IRA would enjoy the cash flow and your, your IRA would enjoy the appreciation on the property. But if you have 60% leverage on an asset, uh, the uh, income on the property and capital gains appreciation uh, on the property becomes subject to the UB tax to the degree of the leverage. So in other words, if you got, if your IRA got, let's just say $500 a month in cash flow, and depreciation wrote off $200 a month in cash flow, $300 was still subject to the UB tax, but not the entire $300, but only 60% of that because that's the leverage. So I hope I'm not confusing the audience, but the income uh, from the property, the net, net operating income will be subject to UB tax to the degree of the, uh, of the mortgage leverage. And the same if thing happens, ex- go ahead. If I may, the, you know, one of the reasons that, and so you're describing it beautifully and I, I would like for people to really understand it conceptually because you laid out the hundred percent purchase price scenario, which is what it is, uh, which is tremendous, but it's a choice. The leverage one using leverage with your IRA. Uh, so your IRA makes a down payment and, and acquires a loan is an interesting one because it's one of the only ways that the IRS will let your IRA make money on money that you don't contribute. Now I know that you and I are going to talk about something that's even a little bit more sophisticated of a scenario, but it can increase your, your buying power, your IRA's buying power. So, and you are using somebody's money that you didn't actually contribute to the IRA. And that's actually conceptually the way that you you may think about where the UBIT is. So UBIT is taxed on the profits, the net profits that are associated with the outstanding debt percentage. And so what you're really doing is pay, it's a cost of doing business with other people's money because you never actually contributed it according to the rules into the IRA. It doesn't have the full tax benefit. Now you still, there's still a benefit. Absolutely. Assuming you, you've picked a good property, but it's not exactly the same because you're using somebody else's, somebody else's money. So it's uh, taxed on the net profits that are associated with the outstanding debt. So that conceptually is where it comes from. Great, thank you. That's a great, that's a great comparison, great, great explanation. Yeah, it's other people's money. So other people's money get taxed. The mortgage money is where the UBIT uh, gets triggered. Sure. So to make long story short, you would be subject to UBIT on the received net operating income after depreciation. Uh, and in addition to that, on resale, uh, if the property appreciated from $100,000 to say $150,000, and you had 60% mortgage when you, and you sold it, you realized uh, $50,000 capital gain, that would be subject to your bid too, uh, to the degree of the leverage, which in this case is 60%. So in both scenarios, you would your IRA would receive less upside because of the UBIT tax. Now let's talk a little bit about an alternative scenario that I wanted to point out to uh, listeners that it's a very powerful concept. And this concept can help you do exactly the same thing, get control over the property, receive all the net or wide majority of the net operating income from the property and let your IRA capture virtually all appreciation on the property. This is an advanced technique. If it's confusing, again, please um, (laughs) refer back to the uh, newsletter that is uh, going to come out in early January, 2018. And um, Clay and I will also do a webinar on the same subject to talk a little bit about self-directed IRA investing and uh, to talk about this idea. So it'll be a presentation and you'll be able to see it. Probably gonna come out in late January. Uh, This is when we're gonna do the webinar and then probably make it available on New Direction IRA site and our website a little bit later. So here's a technique. This is a million dollar idea, (laughs) if you wanna call (laughs) from the big mic. I hope so. Uh, 
Yeah, and I, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, I'm not a CPA. I'm not a lawyer. The disclaimer is I'm not giving legal or accounting or financial advice. Please uh, consult your uh, tax professional or legal professional to make sure this is compliant. But to the best of my knowledge and to the best of um, my experience, this technique should be kosher, if you want to call it that way. So uh, uh, the idea is, is the same. So you get a financial friend. So a financial friend could be your brother, your sister, your good friend, cannot be a linear ascendant or descendant, cannot be your parents, your grandparents, cannot be your kids, cannot be your grandkids. But if I understand things correctly, if you, uh, your in-laws, your father-in-law or your mother-in-law could be that financial friend too. I think those are not prohibited parties. The only prohibited parties, and I'll turn it over to Clay, uh, what are the prohibited parties? which people you cannot inter your IRA cannot interact with uh, ever. So who are the prohibited parties per the IRA rules? Right. So when it comes to disqualified persons, uh, each IRA has its own set, and it is the account holder and their spouse, ascendants and descendants, and the descendant spouses. So lineal ascendancy and descendancy. Now siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, those are all non-disqualified persons, so they don't have the same restrictions interacting with the IRA that those disqualified persons do. And there's a, a list of those prohibited transactions, so the restrictions that the disqualified persons have. And, you know, that, that can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but generally speaking, it's, it's a cash transaction or an asset kind of transaction or some kind of credit arrangement. Those things are all prohibited for that particular set of persons. I will also say that some fiduciaries to a particular plan can also be considered disqualified persons, but that's, it's less common. I understood. Thank you for clarification. So these disqualified parties, they cannot be a financial friend. In this model, they, they, they should not, cannot just find a different financial friend. Find truly a good, uh, a good uh, friend that you work with and, um, or, you know, your sibling, uncle, aunt so on. So the concept is this. So the, let's just say your IRA wants to buy the house, but the way it would work is that your financial friend would buy a house. They would actually go to the bank and get a mortgage. So let's use the same example of $100,000 house and your financial friend would go to the bank, get qualified. Let's assume for the moment that credit is good and they qualify for the mortgage and they get the mortgage on the property and they need say um, $25,000 down payment. $75,000 mortgage, and let's just say, for the sake of a discussion, $5,000 closing cost. So in this particular case, they need to come up with $30,000 and, and get a mortgage, and um, then your financial friend will own the house. So here comes the beautiful technique. The technique is that your IRA can make a second lien loan, a second mortgage on the same property, lending $30,000 to your financial friend. And uh, they can record a mortgage as a second lien on the property. And uh, the second lien mortgage could have a high interest rate, which is typical. Second liens have higher degree of risk than the first lien mortgages. And it is perfectly acceptable to set, say, 10, 12%, maybe even higher interest rate on a second lien mortgage. So take an example of what we just talked about. If a property had a uh, net operating income of, uh, just say for the sake of the discussion here, $300 a month after the first mortgage. So in that scenario, the $300, <clears throat> if IRA owned the house outright, the $300 would go to the, IRA uh, to the IRA custodian as a cash flow every month. But there would be UBIT and the IRA would actually have to file taxes in the old scenario. In the new scenario, the, uh, uh, the income would go to the financial friend, $300 a month, but there would be a second mortgage payment. And if, uh, IRA made a $30,000 loan with 12% annual interest, just for the sake of a discussion. 12% annual interest, it comes up to be $300 a month. So the entire cash flow from the property could be paid to the IRA custodian as interest on that second lien mortgage. So this technique of a second lien provided the down payment funds and is capturing all available cash flow as an interest on a second lien. So this, te this technique uh, effectively lets the IRA get the benefit of the cash flow of the house with leverage of the mortgage. The second thing happened uh, was that the IRA can buy an option on this property. 
It's a separate transaction and uh, an IRA can come in and uh, to your financial friend and say, listen, you know, I, I gave a second loan. You're not out of pocket any money. Uh, you can, uh, we can make a deal where we'll set uh, $50 a month for you uh, of the cash flow for the management of the property. So uh, the interest that gets set on the loan could be less than 12%, it could be 10%, could be something that leaves a little bit of money uh, as a cash flow to the financial friend for helping with this transaction. But now let's talk about capturing the upside. So to capture the upside, the IRA will buy. Before you go on, so the financial friend, what is their revenue structure? I, I, I'm curious about that myself. So their revenue structure would be this. So uh, what's the upside? The financial friend's upside is really simple. Yes, they, their liability is they're signing up for the mortgage. Uh, but their upside is they could get a little bit of uh, cash flow from the property. So if a property cash flow, $300 a month, and the interest payment to the IRA is $250 a month for $200 a month, there is a little bit of an upside to the financial friend for doing this. The second element to this is you could set uh, the transaction in a way that there is an appreciation upside for the financial friend. So here is an example of what we could do with an option. So I could buy an option on the property. Let's use an example of uh, the same $100,000 purchase with $5,000 uh, closing cost. So all in is 105. Uh, an IRA could buy an option on the same property uh, to buy the property uh, from the financial friend, let's, let's just use for the sake of the argument, a strike price of $115,000. So $10,000 above the cost basis of the, uh, of the investment. So uh, what would happen is uh, the option is worthless if the house is sold for any number uh, below $115,000. And then it does capture all the upside above $115,000. And the IRA could pay a consideration to the financial friend for the option. And the consideration could be $1,000, could be $2,000, something meaningful. It's not free money. So uh, that option would control the upside uh, and the house gets sold 20 years later for 150, 200,000. The option would capture effectively all the upside uh, on the house uh, above 115,000. And the financial friend would keep $10,000 for making this happen. And um, the IRA would benefit uh, essentially from wide majority of the upside on this transaction. So the option could have 20 year lifetime, a 30 year lifetime, could have a strike price of $115,000 and have you know one or $2,000 consideration. So the financial friend's benefit is a little bit of cash flow to get an op option price consideration and they get a little bit of uh, appreciation upside on the property. And their responsibility is essentially to take the mortgage out and be the owner and file taxes on the property. So that concept uh, provides benefit to the financial friend, but it provides a very powerful benefit to the IRA uh, itself. So the benefit here is the fact that the, there's no UBIT tax, number one. Number two, mortgage terms are more beneficial. So mortgage terms, instead of, say, 60% loan-to-value mortgage, this becomes a 75% loan-to-value mortgage with a rate better than uh, in a non-recourse loan. Uh, so that would improve the cash flow. And then the final element to the whole thing is there is no UBIT on any cash flow. There's no UBIT on, uh, on their appreciation. And if you add up the numbers, it is significantly better than if IRA paid a UBIT of 60% on the income derived and all the appreciation. So that's, that's all I'm saying. You know, that makes a lot of sense to me, Mike. And I, I had not heard this, this strategy before. And so as I sit here and kind of digest it as, a, as an IRA provider, I certainly see the, that you're uh, avoiding the UBIT because the income is structured in such a way that it's, it wouldn't be subject to UBIT. And I also noted that the financial friend is making some money. So it is a real financial transaction for everybody. And one of the things that I've always kind of liked about it, it passed the, the smell test. I wanted to make sure that <laughs> it is not structured to avoid the taxation. IRS shows up one day and says, you have just done tax. Um, what, what do they say? So tax evasion is illegal, but tax avoidance is legal. Right, right. And, you know, we were talking about this before. The it's often really the most powerful when somebody takes the, the tools that are available, the, the dynamics that are associated with these accounts, and then thinks about 
the way that real estate or some other asset class makes money. And so in this way, the strategy that somebody can come up with is can be tailored to not only the asset class, but also the tool that they're using. And I, I also noted that the, you know, there's a part in the internal revenue code that says that you can't avoid a prohibited transaction by triangulating it. In other words, if I own a property personally, I can't sell it to my brother who's non-disqualified and then have my IRA buy it because that's, it's an indirect way to, to perform a prohibited transaction. But this with the financial friend part of it is not seeking to avoid a prohibited transaction. It's just seeking to avoid taxes, which I, again, I think ties into what you just said about, uh, you know, trying to avoid paying taxes is okay, but evasion is not or the yeah, that expression. Yeah. So it really ties right into that. So it's been interesting for me to listen to the marriage of the investment tools with the, the account advantages. Clay, and I greatly appreciate your view here because you are a neutral party here. Your responsibility is to ensure compliance. And I, I appreciate the fact that you actually like the idea that it looks like it is uh, absolutely clean and compliant and it's not trying to create the illegal triangle of um, your IRA buying a property through you know three-way transaction with your brother or your sister. So yes, there's a concept of golden triangle. You could, you know, do deal with financial friends, help each other. But this is a straightforward, simple idea. Not only that, I wanted to um, point this out to the audience. The power of uh, loans combined with options is almost infinite. You could leverage this idea on any other asset. It doesn't have to be real estate. You could do the same way on many other things. So an example would be, could be equipment. I mean, it could be medical equipment provide a loan on the equipment and buy an option on the equipment. Well, equipment happened to be depreciating asset, but um, there are appreciating assets. And then you could buy an option on that appreciating asset. Real estate is one of them, but there are other appreciating assets. And um, I had another you know, guest uh, on a podcast that was recording a couple of days ago. And we we're chatting briefly about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And yes. uh, <laughs> my two cents would be, don't buy an option on Bitcoin or any of those things. Uh, well, you know, we're going to laugh about this. There's another IRA custodian that I know that just enabled their account holders to be able to invest in the uh, crypto. And my two cents is Benjamin Graham said, this is not investing. Investing is you're looking for a degree of safety first. So when you're making a second lien loan on a property, the property has value and the property is appreciating its cash flowing. So when you make it an investment, think about the safety of the investment first, and then the speculation second. Cryptocurrencies, as we all know, have been appreciating at a crazy, crazy rate, but they're not investments. They are pure speculation. Not only that, uh, it's appreciated at such a rapid pace that to me, it just looks like a big balloon performing. It's the, the, the dot-com days again. So <laughs> I, I can't have enough said about it because everybody's going crazy and people are thinking, let me buy some Bitcoin with uh, my self-directed IRA money. Well, well good luck you know, with this. I hope, hopefully you'll, uh, <laughs> you'll be okay. You know, we had, we had so much demand for that. We actually have launched that ability as well. Really? We Amazing. did. Wow. Yes. We had, we had so many, and, and, and this goes back to kind of our company philosophy, which is we're supposed to help you do what you want to do. We're not, we're not there to get in the way. You want to do crazy things. You don't, you, you don't stop people from doing it. Right. And so people were wanting it. And so we figured out a, a system to, to be able to start folks. And, and we also, we're going to have a number of improvements on it over the next three months. So it's something to look for, but we had the same experience. People are just, they just want to get in there. Wow. This is, this is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking with my good, good friend, Corey Boatwright. He's actually, he's, he's, he, his episode is coming and he's a big crypto supporter. And uh, he said, Mike, you should buy some Bitcoin. You should buy some Litecoin. You should buy some of other coins. I said, listen, you know, I feel very comfortable with uh, real estate investing, but going into crypto, it's pure speculation. At the same time, it's been appreciating at such a rapid rate that people are just afraid to miss, miss the bus. But, you know, again, I'm back to the Benjamin Graham. It's not investing, it's speculation. If you want to put a little bit of your money 
Um, I had a call with Corey yesterday. I mean, just to, just to talk about this, okay? So uh, he basically said, listen, Mike, you play poker, and I, I play poker. There's no secret to that. You go to the World Series of Poker. I say, yes, I go to the World Series of Poker. Haven't you bought in $10,000 entry fee at the World Series of Poker? I say, I do it every year. I come in and I play a tournament and I pay in $10,000 or $1,500 or $3,000 entry fee. And my chances of winning are not high. I said, I agree. I absolutely agree. I'm investing in my skill. I believe I'm a good poker player. And my expectation is pretty low that I'm going to lose the money. That's my general expectation. And... Um, I said, that's it. Don't take grand that you're going to invest in a World Series of Poker uh, tournament and put it in Bitcoin. I said, Corey, from that perspective, you're right. But <laughs> your IRA money, I don't know. You've got to be a little bit more careful because you can lose all your IRA money chasing the million-dollar Bitcoin. So we've, we've had some interesting other account holders as well. We actually had an account holder that bought into a racehorse syndicate. Um, and some other things like that. So it really, people are so creative and everybody has a different risk tolerance, but the discussion is always fun about how they, how they see things. Yeah. Well, you can invest, right? I mean, you allow people to invest in the private equity. You can invest, allow people to invest in businesses. Uh, as you know, I, I manage a couple of uh, funds and our flagship fund, Tampa Opportunity Fund. We actually invest in a mix of um, hard money loans, like we talked about, and we invest in some of the uh, long-term equity deals and people get very creative. I mean, we invest in the syndications of self-storage facilities, multifamilies, um, uh, ground up construction and whatnot. You allow people to invest in, in the fund like us. And then there's other opportunities that could be completely different. Like you said, like a horse race, um, what is a syndication? The sky's the limit. Just just to Bitcoin, the, the fact that, that these things appreciate so fast, and by the way, half of these, um, according to the term ICOs, in my view, half of them, if not 90%, if not 99%, are illegal. Think about, think about this. They claim it to be currency. There's only one legal currency in the United States. As far as the U.S. law, U.S. dollar is the only legal tender. If you pay somebody in Bitcoin, Litecoin, or whatnot, it is not a legal tender, per se, right? Uh, and all, all these vendors that have put together pay with Bitcoin functionality like Overstock, um, they effectively take it to an exchange and you have to sell the Bitcoin and then they transfer dollars to pay in dollars. Just to, I'm just making this comment so people know this is not necessarily you can pay with Bitcoin. It's not a legal tender per se. But a lot of other ICOs, all these little uh, currencies that are out there, the cryptocurrencies, are either illegal currency, so which is one possibility. The second thing, it's an illegal security. Basically, they're offering security, they're trading a security, and as far as the SEC is concerned, they should be illegal. So that's my two cents. I'm shutting up on the Bitcoin. There's probably a number of people who hate my guts for making these negative comments. By the way, I, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope all you guys, and I was talking to Corey yesterday, I said, you, Corey, and, and many of my friends who are into crypto, I sincerely hope you make a fortune on this, and I might buy one Bitcoin or a fraction of a Bitcoin just for fun of it, but fundamentally, I don't believe in it. I, I, I don't think it's a, um, I think the technology is very powerful, and it will be Crypto 2.0. When the Crypto 2.0 comes out, uh, there might be an evolution of uh, compliance, some kind of regulatory environment, uh, making sure that all this stuff is legal, but the concept is, is pretty powerful. It's a limited supply of these digital coins and then uh, it is used as a way to store value as a payment system yes there's some benefits as a payment system it's the payment but bitcoin today i don't know if you know and i may be wrong i don't know these the exact figures but what i heard it takes about a thousand dollars to create one bitcoin today just mining cost right it's a very high cost of you know transaction and two every transaction is getting longer and slower now to buy make a transaction i don't know what it takes it's getting because the chain is getting just longer and longer and longer. And they have to be verified by the miners. So the technology needs a evolution, otherwise it's gonna slow down. And the cost of every transaction is gonna get higher and higher and higher. Today, from what I heard latest, every Bitcoin transaction costs like five bucks. Tomorrow it's gonna to be 10, day after tomorrow it's gonna to be 20. And um, yeah, maybe it's gonna be a million dollar Bitcoin, but the point is, it's not something that I believe is a very good uh, way to store value. It is a trustless 
trust environment. I, that, that far I could tell you. Anyway, let's go back to our discussion. <laughs> we just deviated too much, but I appreciate you um, clarifying that. Is that functionality available? It could actually set up a self-directed IRA transaction now to buy some Bitcoin? Yes. Is that functionality available? Yes, to buy and a Who do you work with? Do you work with Coinbase? Well, in our particular case, we've started the, the initial launch. We have two vendors that are doing the actual exchange from dollars to whatever the cryptocurrency they're buying. Um, so we don't actually have a direct uh, exchange relationship yet. So we're having folks go through uh, a couple of vendors. But we're, we have a proprietary uh, hardware cold storage device because you know, our role, we really do. You gotta be able to store. What if, what if you lose the, what if you lose the, cre the key? What if you lose the device? I just one thing well, worries me about the whole thing. There sure. is no recovery. You can't go to the bank and say so, somebody stole your, your, your deed to a property. Your deed to the property is your private key. If there was an electric shock and your hard drive got wiped, oh boy, you, you just lost everything. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're keeping it in cold storage is so that it's not on the net all the time and, and vulnerable. Yeah, heck. And also because we have to be in control of it because we're holding those assets in trust for the account holder. One of the things that we've seen is that uh, some IRA providers are using LLCs and things like that. And there's, that's a pretty gray area as well. So we've, we've gone with something that for the moment at least is very simple um, we do have some safeguards in terms of recovery and things like that. Um, but we've, we've worked hard to just you know, come up with a way to do this because our account holders wanted to. Interesting. I appreciate you, uh, learn something new today that you guys do it. <laughs> and I, I was thinking to invest, maybe I'll do something like that just, just to see how it works. Yeah, so, sure. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I think we covered most of the interesting topics uh, that we wanted to chat about. Um, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about? So we, we covered the self-directed IRA, the benefits, all the, the world is the sky's the limit per se. And we can talk more about all kinds of other things. But um, I, uh, I particularly think it's, you know, it, it's the best thing after sliced bread and not after the Bitcoin. <laughs> but self-directed IRA, it's the power in your hands. Um, well, I so just want to... this was pretty educational. I hope I hope the audience is going to like this 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 discussion. Well, I I always appreciate getting to talk to you, Mike, because like I say, you do have a very innovative mind, and as I say, we're here to to execute what the account holders want to do. So when they get new ideas, I like to you know know what they are and how they work and all that stuff. So I appreciate you explaining it, and I I did get a chance to look at your slides, get a little preview of the the webinar that we're going to do in January. And, you know, sometimes that's helpful, too, is to see it uh, on, on the screen because your slides are, are very explanatory. So I think it's in the newsletter, too. But I, I'm looking forward to those events as well. So I appreciate you having me on today. Clint, thank you kindly. And just for the audience, I think we're scheduling the webinar will be on uh, Thursday, January 25th, 8 o'clock at night. And uh, we'll have... Um, the link or information available on our website and I'm sure it's going to be available on your website as well. So just for the audience, it's going to be eight o'clock Eastern time on um, Thursday, January 25th. Yep. And again, for the audience, uh, would you be so kind as to uh, provide information on uh, how people can learn about New Direction IRA? Is there a website, phone number? How sure. would they uh, reach out to you if they wanted to open an account or learn a little bit more about self-directed IRA investing. Absolutely. So the website is newdirectionira.com and it's a very educational website. We, we do seek to give people the information that they need to get comfortable with the idea. Uh, you can always email us. It's That's at info at ndira.com and we have people who man that email and can answer any questions that you have. And 877-742-1270 is our toll-free line and like I say, no matter where you are in the process, whether you're just investigating or you have an old 401k that you're ready to move and position differently, uh, we can take care of your uh, questions and services from start to finish. So we're happy to help if, if that's where you are. Thank you very much, Clay. I greatly appreciate this. Uh, folks, if you want to learn more about um, Clay, you know where to go. And if you want to learn a little bit more about our funds, uh, go to the uh, 
www.templefunding.com or go to bigmikefund.com. Uh, that website should be up and running very soon. We're recording this, this podcast. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be launched, and that, that's the website, bigmikefund.com. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate you listening. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fund Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fund book, head to bigmikefund.com or visit Amazon and type Mike Zlotnick. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.